Hi everyone. Um, today what I want to talk to you about is um, a way to reduce uncertainty in climate model bias correction um, by considering space. And I've spent a bit of time over the last sort of five or six years thinking about how we can correct biases in climate models, particularly in precipitation. And this figure is from um, CMIP3 climate models over Australia and you can see that there's some fairly substantial biases in mean monthly precipitation and that those biases are very model dependent and so we can see some models where we have very large biases in the north and the tropics of the country and then some, bi some models where the biases are much smaller and the, the models are doing much better but also models where we've got biases occurring you know around the coast and so we can see that there's sort of some very strong spatial structure in these biases. But generally when we do bias correction, what we're doing is at a single grid cell comparing the distribution or some form of statistical properties of the observations to the model. And we apply some sort of correction at that single grid cell. We might then move to a, a different grid cell and then have a, a different bias correction at that location. What I'd like to argue in this presentation is that we can make a case for improving that grid cell by grid cell approach by trying to consider um, corrections in space. And there's a couple of good reasons why we might want to do this. Start with, we've got catchments and water resources infrastructure introduce spatial structure into our water resources systems. So, you know, when we're thinking about something, you know, large catchments such as the Murray-Darling Basin or things like that, which cover, you know, quite a number of grid cells here, the structures and the management, you know, like Dirk was just talking about, the way that we manage these river systems implies a spatial structure. As you could see in that previous slide, there's also a clear spatial structure in the biases, which gives us a hint that maybe we should be able to do, um, you know, improve our you know, corrections by including that information. And then the final point that I really think, you know, you know, gives a good reason for why we might want to think about, you know, using spatial information is that we have relatively short records to define the bias properties. And what we've found in a lot of our work is that the biases aren't stationary, that they do change over time. And so therefore, you know, we need to include as much information as we can to come up with stable estimates of bias. Because ultimately what we're doing here is assuming that the biases that we have in the current climate stay the same into the future. So we want to have a, as good an estimate of the bias as we can. Now one way of you know, overcoming this is just to consider biases in the mean or some simple, simple statistics that we can estimate you know, with, with good confidence and, and small uncertainty. But we know for most water resources problems that it's the extremes and the tails of our distributions where we really you know, that have the most impacts in terms of management, whether they're the high tails and causes flooding or lower tails in terms of droughts and you know, interannual variability, these sorts of structures. And so these are the parts of the distribution where we have less information because we might only have one or two of these sort of, you know, events in our distribution to be able to define those biases. So can we use, you know, information from multiple locations to help define the, the, the bias? So thinking about this, and it's been something I've been thinking about for a little while, how would we start to attempt this? So the first approach that I wanted to try out was looking at the spatial correlation structure itself. And this has been done in the context of multi-site rainfall generation. So Sri Shethanthan and Jeff Pegram have a model for doing multi-site rainfall generation where they generate um, rainfall at, at different locations, maintaining spatial correlation as well as temporal correlation both at the same time step and using a lag one spatial, um, yeah, spatial correlation as well. And in this approach, they actually do this at the monthly and at the annual levels. I've previously set up some bias correction methods before um, using this, but without using the spatial autocorrelation, so the spatial correlations. And so my, th my first thought was to you know, attempt to expand my models to include this. Unfortunately, it failed dismally. And mainly, my matrices were almost always close to singular. I couldn't invert them, and they just all blew up. 
So it was a bit back to the drawing board of, of how we could you know, pool information in space. And so what I came up with was something borrowing from the ideas of extreme floods and extreme rainfalls where we can you know, use a region of influence. And here what we're assuming is that the bias at nearby location tells us something about the bias at our location of interest. And so this is commonly used in the context of flood frequency analysis or IDF curve um, where we assume a common distribution to our extreme values. But here what I want to do is in instead use a common distribution to the biases. So this is what I'm going to be presenting in the remainder of the talk. So here um, I've got my model at a single grid cell and my observations. And I've got my correction, or on, my, on the y-axis I've, I've called it bias, but it's actually the correction factor that you need to apply to shift the model to the observation. So shifting the model from the red curve to the black curve. And you can see that, um, so this is a multiplicative bias. And you know, in this particular grid cell for this particular month, our model is underestimating the rainfall, so our, our correction factor needs to be greater than one. I can now, and they haven't actually come out all that well, unfortunately, but also on now, in, as well as the observations and the um, model results themselves, which are still in black and red, I've shown the distributions of rainfall at the nearest nine grid cells surrounding it. So on the figure on, the, on your left is a whole lot of grey curves that maybe the people at the front can see, but the people at the back might not be able to, um, showing the distribution of monthly rainfall at that location from the nearby cells. And you can see on the, on the one at the right, the pink lines are the ones that show the monthly uh, rainfall at, from the GCM at those grid cells. So now I've got my previous um, correction factors. And here on the figure on the left, you can see the correction factors at all of those different grid cells that surround our location of interest. So now if I average those um, corrections, I get the dark blue line that overlays on the original black line. And you can see that it's made those estimates quite a bit more stable. We've got rid of a couple of the peaks at the lowest percentiles, and we've really come up with a, a much more you know, smooth curve. I can replace this for, um, you know, for a different month, and so now this is the January bias um, you know, or correction factors. And you can see here that actually at the surrounding cells, we've got a lot more cases where the model was um, underestimating as before, so there's lines above the one to one, or the, the one line. But at this location, the site was actually overestimating the rainfall, but that blue line's much closer to the one line. I can sh and again, we've got rid of the you know, large you know, deviation in the bias factor, which you know, I, I probably wouldn't believe. I can do this for every month, and you can see in general that the blue lines are, tend to be smoother than the black lines, but that there is actually quite a bit of coherency in the bias at different locations, so it gives me a bit of confidence that this method is going to work. I've done this spatial bias correction using uh, the a gridded rainfall product for Australia from the Australian Water Avail Availability Project. It's on a 0.05 degree grid, and I've um, used area averaging to get it up to the CSIRO Mark 3.6 grid. Um, the grey bit in the middle is where there was some doubt about the reliability of the observation data, so I've left those, one, those grid cells out. So, and I should have said, we, I've done this using a split period, so I've set up the bias parameters using the early part of the record from 1900 to 1950, and then validated the bias on a separate period to really see what would happen as if it's a climate change assessment. So you can see quite large biases in the raw GCM simulations and that both the quantile mapping and then the quantile mapping including the regionalisation or the spatial quantile mapping improve those biases. For the monthly mean, you know, you can estimate the mean bias quite easily and so it doesn't really make much difference whether you use the surrounding sites or not. But once you start to think about, you know, standard deviations or some of the tails of the distribution or some of the variance, you can see that the spatial quantile mapping and so these are the results for the whole country, certainly improves things um, a bit. I've also tried to look at how things are improved across the full distribution of monthly rainfalls. And so here I'm going to use a skill score that Sarah Perkins developed um, for daily rainfalls. And essentially what it does is compares two PDFs to see how much they overlap. 
If you've got a perfect match between the two PDFs, so in this case between my observations and my um, model, then the skill score will be one. And if there's no match at all between those PDFs, then the, over, then the skill score will be zero. And what I find is that the mean skill score across the country is for the spatial quantile mapping approach is higher than the quantile mapping, so that we are improving the distribution as a whole across the country. But how do we do it individual grid cells? Because these are sort of aggregate results. So what we find is that the um, blue cells are where the spatial quantile mapping is um, performing better, and the green cells are where you're know, not using any information from the neighbours is performing better. And so you can see that at the vast majority of locations, including information from the surrounding cells, definitely improves things. In actual fact, the bias correction factors as, as a mean, so before I showed you that distribution across the full um, time scale, uh, the full quantile distribution from zero to 100 per cent, this is just the mean for each grid site, um, for, each, for each grid cell. When we do the regionalised bias, there isn't a big variation, but in some locations, particularly at the bottom of this um, you know, distribution, you can see that the regionalised bias has really brought up those um, estimates and I'd probably you know, think that, that they're going to be more reliable and so it's sort of moderated some of the largest factors which you know, starts to indicate that you're really you know, pulling that information across the space. So in conclusion, if you have limited data um, to define your bias and uncertainty, you can replace time with space. And that you know, in general, bias non-stationarity does contribute to errors in the corrections. So, this spatial bias correction approach shows some promise in providing more stable cor corrections across the full distribution. So thank you. Thanks. We have time for a few questions from the authors, or from the <laughs> sorry, the audience. <laughs> I shouldn't have had a beer at the break. Um, Mika. Um, no, I haven't yet. So at the moment, this was sort of the first, you know, does this even work? And so I just took the nearest or well, eight grid cells to have a set of nine, um, you know, locations to average across. But I would like to see. I think maybe with the GCMs it might make less difference, but for particularly for a regional climate model where you have shorter time frames but much better definition of the topography, I think that that could be really interesting. could be really interesting. Um, I mean, I think this is the problem always with bias correction is that it isn't physical and that it is making this massive assumption that you know, things will stay the same in the future. But yeah, that might be a really, yeah, bor bor borrowing from other places, yep. I think we have time for, well, one more <laughs> quick, quick question. What algorithm are you using for the quantile mapping? What algorithm? It's just a, the most basic quantile mapping that you could use. 